Hello. Today we're going to be taking a look at poles. We've been taking a look at inductive generalization, and uh, poles generally are uh, really the, the kind of scientific generalization that most people uh, have most exposure to and most familiarity with, uh, although we could all be a little more familiar with them. And of course, uh, it would be crazy to uh, start talking about polls without uh, mentioning this very uh, famous event, uh, the presidential election of 1948, uh, in which some number of newspapers uh, went ahead with the headlines based on the uh, most recent poll results uh, uh, and went ahead and printed that uh, Dewey had defeated uh, Harry Truman for the presidency, um, which if you remember your American history, there was not in fact a President Dewey. This photograph here is of course of uh, President-elect Truman uh, holding up uh, the uh, incorrect headline from the Chicago Daily Tribune. A little bit of local history there. Uh, uh, Harry Truman is also a, a, a pretty big part of uh, the beginning of our own uh, institution. So when we're talking about polls, uh, we'll be mentioning some things about uh, a couple of different kinds of polls. Uh, one is election polls, and this is a one that uh, certainly people uh, pay a lot of attention to seasonally, right? They pay attention to election polls when there are sort of major national elections. Um, but of course, there always are uh, issue and opinion polls. And uh, most of the pollsters uh, that that exist, you know, that, that you know, have businesses that that try and figure out what it is that people think about various things. Uh, most of the time, the election polls that they issue uh, are, you know, they're in a some sense an advertisement, right? And in, in uh, they're they're uh, they they take a lot of resources. Uh, they tend to be very expensive. A lot of times, people aren't like paying for them directly. Um, but what they do is they showcase uh, the higher quality pollsters, who then people tend to hire uh, for market research, for policy research, for all sorts of other things. Uh, and so very often, it's the issue polls or the, these opinion polls that are the bread and butter of the polling industry. Even though the election polls are very often their public face. Uh, I should mention an, another couple of things about this. Uh, uh, election polls, of course, are polls that aim to show the state of an electoral contest uh, at the time that the poll was conducted. Um, very often, people will use the poll results to then try and forecast the results of the of that electoral contest. Uh, and it's this uh, conflict of goals that sometimes leads to uh, a way that polls are, are a bit misinterpreted or misreported. Uh, because the pollster themselves are just trying to figure out what the state of things are when they're conducting the poll. And uh, everybody tends to want to read the poll as somehow something like a prediction uh, or something like that. And that's that's really not um, the, the intent of the, the pollster generally. So there's a tension there, uh, and that tension can sometimes uh, uh, result in people looking at things um, in the wrong way. So uh, as polls are generalizations, uh, we want to talk about the sampling procedures that polls uh, and pollsters tend to use. Uh, remember, this is an example of inductive generalization. A generalization is where you take an entire class of things, namely, say, uh, the population of a country, a state, a county, whatever, right? You take a, a whole population and you ask some small subset of that population what they think about something or who they plan to vote for, and uh, then you can make some uh, inferences about the uh, the larger class. Again, it's, it's a very standard inductive generalization here. And so there are a couple of sampling methods that I want to talk about. One of them is called quota sampling, uh, and one of them is called random sampling. Uh, quota sampling uh, is an idea that tends to make a lot of sense to people, right? It sounds like kind of a great idea. Uh, and in fact, I think a lot of people assume that pollsters do a lot of quota sampling, uh, when in, in fact they don't really. Um, Here's how quota sampling works. What you do is you, you force the sample to be representative uh, by having each important characteristic of the population proportionally represented in the sample. Okay, so this we know, we know that a representative sample is a good one, right? We want our samples to be more representative and to the extent that they're not, that's where certain kinds of biases creep in. And so if you have a sample that has too many of this uh, sort of demographic category and not enough of that demographic category, you might look at that and say, ah, there are some sources of bias. And so you might use something like quota sampling, you would think, to try and correct that. 
So for example, if income were an important factor in determining how people vote, then the sample should have all income groups represented in the same proportion as the population at large, uh, ditto for sex, race, age, etc. And that would be, of course, for an election poll. For an issue poll, you would want to know if any of these demographic issues were likely to affect the way that people thought about a certain type of topic. In fact, that might even be some of the data you'd want to get out of the survey. So uh, all of this stuff, again, is, is, is important to consider. Uh, the question is, how should one consider it? And so right away, I think we can see one of the potential problems, right? The, one of the problems is, of course, uh, determining where you stop in terms of trying to make your sample micro representative. Um, you know, do you do you do you balance it in terms of gender? Well, sure, maybe. Uh, do you balance it in terms of uh, you know socioeconomic status? Well, okay, how finely grained do you get that? You know, do you have uh, you know proportional representation sort of above and below 250,000 a year, um, or do you split it up into $50,000 a year sort of you know ranges or or what? What, what, what do you do? Uh, do you split it up by quintile? Do you, you know there, there's 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 all kinds of different relevant questions here, um, you know, and and of course uh, divisions of you know of things like education uh, are are fairly you know complicated, um, so it, it's um it can it can it can be a real can of worms. Right. Uh, Further, and a much more serious flaw actually, is uh, in the method of quota sampling, right? It's that ultimately the choice of who is in the sample is left to the human element, right? So if you're if you're a pollster trying to gather a sample and you say, oh, we need this many more 50-year-old women, right? Uh, we need this many more, uh, you know, uh, uh, middle-income uh, Latinos. We need this, whatever, like whatever it is you need, uh, going and then looking for that to get it into your sample introduces all kinds of biases into the way that the sample is collected. Um, and, and that's actually going to be a, a much, much bigger issue that ends up uh, introducing uh, really various kinds of subtle forms uh, of bias into the sample, uh, even though the goal of doing it that way was to try and make a, a representative sample. And in fact, this was one of the big problems with the polls in 1948, uh, that is the, the Truman and Dewey election that sort of famously got things pretty wrong. Uh, and uh, there was widespread use of quota sampling uh, at that time. And uh, uh, that was, again, part of the reason uh, why the polls uh, didn't, didn't do very well. Other problems included there just not being that many polls, right? Uh, they also tended to stop polling, uh, you know, uh, weeks before the election. Um, you know, it was kind of a, an idea that not much changed over the last weeks of an election. And I um, think that it's pretty obvious that, <laughs> that that's not true. Uh, so that's those are all... Uh, lessons learned. And, and generally, whenever uh, pollsters uh, tend to uh, be more or less embarrassed by a kind of result, uh, there tends to be a lot of correction, right? There tends to be a lot of introspection about that because, uh, again, even though the election polls are sort of the public face of polling, uh, it's all the other polling that in, that, that these uh, firms do that really you know pays their bills uh, over the course of their year-to-year uh, -year existence. And so they 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 want they have some some incentive to try and try and get things as as uh, right as they can. So uh, really, uh, any any reputable pollster is going to use something more like random sampling, right? That's that's a, a better a better standard. And what you do is you try to reach as wide a range of respondents as you can. The idea is that you want uh, every pos every individual in your sample to have something like an equal chance of winding up in, in the sample. Uh, that's the, the goal of the random sample. And it's really hard, actually, to get a truly random sample. Um, and so sometimes you end up having to uh, you know do the best you can and then correct after the fact for some kinds of known non-randomness in your sample. So let's talk about one kind of sample adjustment that's very common. Uh, it's called uh, weighting. Okay? And the idea behind it is as follows. Uh, we tend, we know that some demographics are easier to reach with certain kinds of polling methods, uh, for example, a telephone call, um, than others. And so a telephone poll will tend to return a non-random sample, okay? Uh, and one strategy for dealing with that is then to weight the sample, 
Uh, and so uh, just for an example of what this looks like, uh, this is a, a pretty typical survey sample breakdown uh, from the American Association for Public Opinion Research. Uh, really, really great resource if you want to read more about polling. They have all kinds of resources for uh, people who are not you know, necessarily statisticians, uh, but that really do explain some of this stuff in a, in a really excellent way. So if you'll take a look over here, uh, you know, for example, you might say th like this, this column here represents the actual U.S. population, right? The actual U.S. population is about 48% male, 52% female. It's, you know, has these sorts of, uh, you know, uh, percentages in terms of age, age splits. Um, you know, here are the education splits, right? Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, if you just take a, a, just an ordinary random sample, like a telephone survey, uh, this is something like the results you, you would tend to get, right? This is, again, these t things tend to be sort of known. Uh, you tend to get a, a, a bit more women than men, right, who tend to answer the phone and complete these kinds of uh, surveys or polls. Um, you get many fewer younger people than you get older people. Um, now you can you can use your imagination to explain why you know why these kinds of things uh, are the case, and uh, your imagination might lead you correctly in some cases, incorrectly in others. But um, you tend to get uh, uh, sort of you know a higher uh, education right in into the into the pool than uh, than than you'd think uh, again if, if you were just getting a completely representative sample. And so what what, the, what pollsters tend to do is they tend to then weight female respondents a little bit less than male respondents. Uh, weight the the uh, the male respondents just a tiny little bit more until this the overall weight of the of, of this part of the sample uh, corresponds to their actual presence in the U.S. population and etc. on down the line uh, with the rest of these things. And it requires a lot of you know well-known statistical uh, methods, but um, still, you know, things that, that the average person probably couldn't just walk in and, and uh, sort of, you know, re-jigger re a sample in this way. Uh, but again, these things are not, you know, super controversial in terms of, uh, in terms of statistical methods. Now, as you know, any poll is only as accurate as its sample is representative. And the only truly representative sample is the whole population. Uh, that is, if you're taking a survey to find out what uh, people in the United States think about something, the only way for your sample to perfectly represent the whole U.S. population is for your sample to be the whole U.S. population. That is, to ask everybody. Uh, if you ask less than everybody, now you have uncertainty in your result. You don't know for sure what the people that you didn't ask think about any particular thing. Uh, and, and so to compensate for that, to, to build that in, uh, because that's just something we know about generalizations, uh, there's a couple of uh, elements that statisticians have uh, identified uh, that can help you to determine how accurate or how much uncertainty there is in a public poll. So uh, those uh, measures include uh, the error margin and the confidence level, right? Now the error margin is the likely magnitude of the difference between the sample and the population. And usually uh, any poll you're reading will specify its error margin. Uh, a very typical error margin is somewhere between three and five percent. Um, and so Again, what this means is this is the likelihood, or and and by how much uh, the sample is is probably going to be uh, off in one way or another uh, from the population at large. Okay, that's the error margin. The confidence level uh, refers to the likelihood that a poll with the same methodology would deliver a result within its margin of error. And that figure is is usually not specified in a poll. I, I've, I've, I don't think I've ever seen this actually published in the report of a poll. Uh, it's generally 95% unless otherwise specified. That's a, a kind of industry standard. Um, and uh, it, it, it can be a little hard keeping uh, in mind the difference between these two things. In a sense, the error margin is how... Um, how weird is our sample? That's, that's essentially what it is. Um, uh, how much uh, room is there in the sample for oddballs? And again, usually uh, the, the larger the sample, the smaller that number is. Um, and uh, again, a, a reasonable figure for that number is usually between three and 5%. Uh, the confidence level is the likelihood that uh, you've just gotten 
an excessively weird sample because that can happen sometimes right so any sample is going to be a little bit different from the overall population that's just built into the to the measure here and some of the samples you get are going to be super weird they're going to be weirder than usual that's what the confidence level is meant to measure and so about so 95 percent of your time uh, your poll is going to be within its margin of error and that's uh, effectively how you determine how much uncertainty is built into a poll result so let's talk a little bit about error margins here. Uh, the error margin, again, in a poll reflects that it's possible that a random sample is not perfectly representative of the population. In fact, uh, it's not likely to be perfectly representative of the target population. There's always going to be minor differences. Uh, the larger the sample, the more the law of averages cancels out the likelihood of oddballs. Uh, and so that means the error margin gets lower. Uh, but again, remember, uh, this is just like we talked about earlier, uh, the quality of the sample is always the most important thing. The size of the sample uh, is, is only important insofar as bigger samples tend to be more representative. Also, if you're, you're talking about an election poll or an issue poll on which there's a lot of agreement, uh, that is a more lopsided result. So if you're looking at, you know, uh, you know, a, a, a sample if you're if you're looking at surveying people on what they think about one of two options and uh, almost everybody prefers one to the other uh, then your error margins can get really really small uh, because then you know again the, the because the, the population is more homogeneous right it's uh, each individual member of your sample is more like the others and so uh, forecasting you know looking at error margins for a landslide election are uh, often lower than looking at really close elections really close elections the error margins are um, more significant uh, and of course the error margin given some particular sample and population size is is actually quite a well-studied thing uh, and you can use a whole variety of online calculators to see what it is if you just uh, put in sample size error you know error margin calculator or something like that into google it'll take you to you know five six seven eight nine sites that'll that'll do this for you um, and and even uh, many who will explain what it is that you're doing uh, while you're doing it so while we're on population size because of course that's going to affect how accurate a poll is uh, let's take a look uh, at, at some plausible examples uh, for example there are 235 million eligible voters in the united states all right that's a, an estimate right uh, it's not a, an exact number that's about right um, and that data, I think the newest data I could find on that is around 2018. Uh, it usually takes a little while to process this sort of thing and estimate this sort of thing. But again, 235 million eligible voters. The largest category of, of uh, resident of the country that is not eligible to vote is uh, children, right? There are lots of, uh, lots of children. About 158 million people uh, actually voted in the 2020 presidential election, which was uh, actually quite a significant turnout increase uh, from previous elections. Uh, certainly the one before that uh, was uh, not, a, not a tremendously high turnout election. And so you'll notice there's a big difference between those two numbers, between the number of people who are eligible to vote, who could vote in any given election. You know, there's no legal problems with that. Uh, they are legal, you know, voters if they if they chose to vote. Um, and and of course that 158 million who you know again even a very high turnout election that's a that's a big difference between uh, eligible voters and actual voters. Uh, and different polls will then very often make adjustments to sample registered voters or likely voters, These are especially election polls. Um, election polls have to make this additional determination. They're not just trying to figure out what do people think generally. Uh, you know, issue polls don't have to worry about this. Uh, election polls absolutely do have to worry about who's actually going to be voting here. Uh, and so they have to try and filter their sample not only by uh, all of these, you know, uh, uh, education, income, race, gender demographics, uh, but they also have to try and figure out, you know, who in the sample is actually likely to vote, uh, because that, you know, really affects the, uh, uh, you know, uh, it it affects the usefulness of the poll uh, if used uh, for, for example, forecasting uh, what's going to actually happen. And so. Assuming a population size of 220 million, um, which is smaller than the number of eligible voters, but uh, you know it's 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 the number in between there. Um, 
it used to be the number of eligible voters, right? Uh, so the question would be just, you know, assuming 220 million, nice, nice round number there. How big would a sample have to be to get a margin of error of 5%, right? Plus or minus 5%. Right. So that's not an especially impressive error margin, uh, but it's not too bad. Uh, and so uh, go ahead and pause here and think about it for a second. Make a prediction. All right. The correct answer, uh, again, based on the best statistics we have, is 384. Right. Is that a little lower than you thought? It's, it's, it's dramatically lower than most people think. Right uh, to get a, a population of you know sort of all U.S. voters, right, uh, or all U.S. eligible voters, you should say, uh, all you need to get a five percent error margin is 384 respondents. Uh, again, as long as those respondents constitute something resembling a random sample. Um, in fact, you might say, well, gosh, if, if you only need 300, you know, or more people, why don't we, you know, get a whole whole bunch and make these these surveys really accurate? Well, here's what happens. Um, if you if you bump that sample size up to about 500, which is a, not a terribly uncommon sample size for a poll, um, you get uh, a, an error margin of 4.38%. Uh, okay, and again, that's not too bad. It's not great, but it's not too bad. Uh, a sample size of 1,000 people, right? So if you double your sample size, you get your uh, margin of error all the way down to 3.1%, right? Which is a sort of a 1.28% uh, gain over, uh, you know, so you get you get an extra 1% of accuracy uh, by doubling your effort, okay? And so I uh, think of doubling effort tends to mean doubling expense. So let's go ahead and double it again to 2,000 people, and now all of a sudden you've got a less than 1% gain there. You get your accuracy to uh, you know, an error margin of 2.19%. Uh, if you double it again, uh, you get um, an error margin of 1.5%. Again, that's only a 0.64% gain over the previous. And again, notice we're doubling every time, and we're getting sort of less and less of a result. Uh, a sample size of 8,000 people, right? Uh, I've lived in towns smaller than that, uh, gets an error margin of 1.1%, which is again, uh, getting close to that just half percent gain for, for doubling, right? Getting all the way up to 8,000 people. So if you're looking at these kinds of results, uh, you're seeing what is known as diminishing returns. That is, you put in more and more and more and more effort to get you know, smaller and smaller and smaller gains. And all kinds of things in life uh, are subject to diminishing returns. Uh, you know, for example, if you want to be a really great, you know, uh, free throw shooter, right? If you, you know, practice, if you shoot 10 free throws a day from now until, you know, next month, you're going to get a lot better. Right, but if you want to get, you know, if if you if you're already making, you know, 95% of your free throws, you're going to have to start shooting 100 a day, uh, really, to start getting that closer to 100, right? Uh, and then you're going to have to start shooting 1,000 a day, right, uh, to get another little incremental improvement because it's, you know, when, when there's uh, less performance to be gained, it's it's just harder to gain it, uh, and that's uh, that again applies in many areas of life, and so as you'll see. Somewhere between 500 and 2,000 people tend to be where a lot of, of sample sizes wind up uh, because that's a fairly economic survey. Uh, it gets you a, a perfectly decent sample uh, and a you know an error margin between two and five percent is perfectly respectable and perfectly useful for any 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 you know standard application. It's it's generally good enough. But in case you were curious, uh, if you went ahead and doubled it all the way up to 16,000, uh, you still, uh, that, that, that's how much it takes to get an error margin of less than 1%. But um, uh, again, the, the, the gain over an 8,000 person sample is, is really just not very significant. So one of the things that uh, uh, kind of, you know, gives me a little bit of a, oh, and, and, uh, an itchy feeling sometimes, uh, you know, right between the shoulder blades, is that very often when when poll results get reported, they get reported by uh, as single numbers, and I I've I've always thought this was a little funny, uh, and I really do wish that that it was different, right? I, I wish that uh, uh, instead of saying here are the numbers and the error margin is plus or minus three percent, uh, I really do just wish they'd supply a range, right? So say for example you were going to take a poll as to which Star Trek captain was better. Um, I, I don't think this poll is plausible. I think that you know Picard would get a much higher score even than that, uh, or at least should uh, if he if he if he wouldn't. Um, you know between these two, absolutely the superior Star Trek captain, in uh, in my view, which is of course the correct one. So uh, so there you go. Uh, 
another way of putting it, okay, uh, would be to you know to say, look, it, the, the result could could scoot either way, right? And so the poll here is showing us that Kirk has approval somewhere between 35 and 41 percent, and Picard has has a number somewhere between 65 and 59 percent. Now I've I've gone from low to high on one and high to low on the other because of course uh, we're assuming they would trade off against each other if everybody in fact responds to the poll one way or the other. Uh, many polls, of course, have a no response or you know no preference or something like that, you know, and that's that's fine. You should put those those in ordinary polls. This one does not because it's a, it's a fictional poll. Um, but the idea is again, uh, think of uh, think of a poll as 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 a range, um, and the areas toward the middle are probably more likely than the areas toward the edges of those polls. But again, think of it as a range. That's really what the error margin means. So, for example, if you take a poll like this one, right, this much narrower poll, uh, where Picard is coming in at 44, Kirk at 42, again with an error margin of plus or minus three, uh, very often you'll hear people sort of blithely say, oh, well, Picard's winning this poll. Now, look, it might be slightly more likely for, you know, given this result for Picard to have more support than, than Kirk here, but... But it might not, right? Um, uh, the, the correct answer is really nobody. Sometimes you'll hear this called a statistical tie. Um, and, and the poll, you know, given the data that it has, given the error margin it has, uh, could indicate 39 to 47 or even 45 to 41, right? Um, I mean, it, gets, uh, it could get, uh, could sort of go, again, either way. Uh, now, we're going to talk a few times about... Um, some of the mistakes that tend to get made uh, with error margins, and uh, some of those are as follows. Right. So one mistake that sometimes gets made is where people will publish polls but then will not publish the error margin. Uh, this one drives me crazy uh, because I, I think for a lot of in a lot of ways you need to know the error margin. Um, this uh, was a Huffington Post a, a, a you know poll results section where I'm sure if the, if you if you clicked on some of these. Um, some of these individual polls, you could get to information that then would have their their error margins uh, available, but just not having them available right when reported, I think, is um, uh, not great. Uh, sometimes you'll see uh, that reporters will report leads, uh, I, and as I put that in scare quotes there, that are within the error margin. Um, now, this is much more common in close elections uh, or, or in elections where the polling is, is pretty close. So I had to go uh, all the way back to 2016 for this uh, example, but, you know, again, it's just an example. Uh, and so uh, each of these, um, uh, each of these uh, uh, results that I've uh, put a little arrow toward, in fact, is, uh, is reporting a lead, right? Uh, and yet it's um, within the error margin. Now, now I know it, it's not just automatic here. I know they have machinery to say tie because they have tie when when this middle number here is exactly the same. But that's that's not exactly right. I mean, a statistical tie is when the result is within the error, within the margin of error. That puts it into a kind of fog of uncertainty where it's not clear uh, who's actually uh, you know sort of leading. Uh, and that's where you you know again have to be pretty careful. And the margin of error here is reported in most of these cases. Some of there's there's a couple of polls that. That, uh, that do not have this. One thing I, I do also want to say that I really like it when when they publish the sample size. So you'll see again these samples are yeah right around a thousand. You know you've got a couple you know uh, you know two three thousand uh, person polls there, and there's also these initials. So this is uh, this LV or RV. RV might, is, is very often registered voter. LV is likely voter. So that means that the pollster has done something to try and filter the result um, uh, to, you know, only the likely voters being in their sample or only the registered voters being in their sample. Uh, again, just to try and make the uh, uh, poll somewhat more accurate uh, as a forecast of, of sort of actual electoral performance. Um, this is a, a little bit uh, more recent. I mean, they're, they're, again, this is a, the polling wasn't as close in this uh, last election. Um, and so, but every now and then you'll get a poll that uh, how, is within its margin of error, like this one here. Um, and uh, again, you know, I, I like when they publish the sample there. Um, but again, they're, they're sort of, you know, putting the big red box around something, uh, even though, again, it's within the error margin. They should have put a gray box over both to say, that one's within the error margin. Um, I, I would very much prefer that. Another mistake sometimes that gets made, uh, usually uh, it, this is the kind of mistake that gets made by somebody whose favorite candidate is trailing in the polls, uh, because uh, in general, 
if you're watching a couple of people at a bar and you're not watching the game that's behind you, but you're watching the fans, uh, the one that's that's complaining about the officials is usually the one whose team is losing. That's just kind of how that works, right? You tend to complain about polls if you're behind in them or if your favorite candidate is behind. You don't tend to uh, complain about them when you're a candidate's head. You think, oh, well, gosh, these polls might be really excellent if, you're, if your favorite candidate's ahead. And that's human nature. It's dumb, but it's, it is human nature. So, um, for example, this is a, 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 a you know, a, 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 from back in the 2016 election, uh, uh, was, you know, something was actually published. Uh, and it said this, it said in the recent Remington Research Group polls, Hillary leads in Colorado, 45 to 43, Pennsylvania, 45 to 42, Wisconsin, 46 to 41, and Virginia, 48 to 43. The polls were taken between October 20 to 22. The margin of error is plus or minus 2.5%, again, which means that it's not necessarily accurate to say that Hillary leads in all of those. Um, uh, and again, this is mean, and, and what they, they the, the, the takeaway they say, meaning that many of these Hillary leads are perhaps smaller than they appear. Now that's a mistake because, of course, the leads are perhaps larger than they appeared, um, and uh, you know that's that's uh, the case in some of these cases. In fact, it it was it probably was larger than that in Colorado. I, I memory doesn't serve, but I, I I pretty sure Hillary carried Colorado by more than by more than two points. Just. Um, you know, I'd have to look that one up, but uh, just looking at these results, uh, I, I sort of think maybe that's the case. Anyway, um, it doesn't it doesn't really uh, matter anymore. This is just an example of, of a particular kind of thing that sometimes people are tempted to do. Another mistake uh, that people uh, really like to, to make is trying to sort of unskew the polls, right? Uh, uh, not really understanding how much really excellent social science has already gone into the crafting of most public polls. Uh, again, there are some polls that are of, of fairly low quality, but it's not because of th their their sample uh, uh, construction, right? That's not. Um, if there are problems with the sample construction, there are other problems as well. Uh, I'll, I'll say. Um, so this this here quote from a, a you know polling analyst uh, extraordinaire Nate Silver uh, puts it, I think, very well. So I've just quoted him here. Uh, he says it's easy to find fault with a poll, even from the best pollsters. Anybody passionately arguing that a poll is wrong because its sample has too many X's or too many of this group are voting for whatever is probably wrong. As you dig into a survey's cross tabs, that is looking at college educated white men, for example, or Hispanics 65 years and older, you're sacrificing sample size for specificity. The margins of error of sub samples can get huge. Further, most pollsters weight their results by demographics, such as age and race, and not attitudes, like party identification. They do so because historically this has produced the most accurate result. Picking apart individual polls is usually a bad use of time, and the people doing it tend to have a motive. So if you want a, an example of just exactly that, um, uh, again, uh, it's easier to complain about polls when one's favorite candidate is behind them, so if you sort of look around there. Uh, Here's an example of that. Uh, the of course is in Arizona, for instance, where the Fox News poll of 732 likely voters was conducted between August and September. The political identification of respondents skewed heavily Democrat. Notice that's the the complaint here, right? It said 46% of Republicans identified as Democrat compared with 43 who identified as Republicans, with 11% undecided. Um, you know, and and they do all this stuff to you know say essentially if you subtract one from the other, you end up with a number, right? Uh, and so. Essentially, they're trying to complain that the sample itself had too many Democrats in it or not enough Republicans. And again, uh, the, the sample itself was weighted for all the things that historically make polls uh, sort of more accurate waiting for, and it was not weighted for things that historically have not made polls more accurate and waiting for. So again, there's a tremendous amount of social science that's gone into the way that pollsters tend to collect their samples and treat their samples, at least, again, at least the, the best ones. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the Fox News poll is generally fine. Uh, so... Again, there's there's a you know a lot of uh, something else going on here, right? There's a uh, this is generally not a great use of time. Another mistake, and this is a mistake actually that that pollsters will sometimes make, right? So it's not always people reporting the polls the the polls that make uh, the mistakes or misunderstandings. So very often, uh, there are not a lot of uh, very well statistically trained uh, news media personnel, and uh, most of the reason that we don't catch them on it is because most people in the general population are not well uh, educated in terms of of basic statistics, uh, and that's unfortunate. Uh, but you know, if you're here in a school, you're in the right place to try and fix that. <laughs> 
So here's a mistake that even, you know, that even sometimes pollsters will make, uh, you know, they're generally pretty high, you know, educated people who know their business, but uh, they'll sometimes make some mistakes here. And one of those mistakes is called herding. Uh, herding is the name that describes the practice of pollsters not releasing polls that look like outliers as an election approaches. Right now, it, it can be easy to see why they might do that sort of thing. Uh, after all, remember that confidence interval is about 95 percent. So that means that about one out of 20 polls you can expect to be just outside of the error margin. About one out of every 20 times you can expect that maybe your sample's just goofy, right? And 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 you know so. When you see a result that looks way different than everybody else's polls look, or that even your previous polls looked, you might say to yourself, hmm, maybe we got a weirdo on our hands, you know, a weird sample, and, and just not publish that one, right? You know, after all, you might say, look, you have to use our judgment here. We think in our judgment this is a weird poll. Um, but, you know, and again, that's a fairly normal thing to do, but it, what it can do is that that can contribute to people sort of, you know, missing real actual movement uh, in the way that things uh, really are in the public. Um, and so what, what happens is that actually makes any individual poll more likely to be accurate by being closer to the consensus, right? Because that is one way of telling maybe when you have an outlier is if it really is way off the consensus. But it tends to make the total of all polls less likely to be accurate by sort of artificially cherry picking the data. Um, and so in general, it's it's a it's a practice you, you shouldn't do. But it's really hard if you're a pollster to tell the difference between herding and between just releasing, uh, you know, obviously garbage data. Uh, so it's, it's it can be really hard to tell. And I have no you know, I have a lot of sympathy uh, for um, uh, for those folks in those sorts of situations. Uh, it's not obvious what the correct thing to do is. Uh, so if, if you want an example, um, this one uh, goes back to uh, Senate uh, elections. Um, um, and it's a nice visual here from uh, from 538 about uh, you know the, when they were sort of explaining herding. And so if you look here, here's uh, the sort of average, right? This is the the sort of average of polling over the course of uh, a number of months. And um, the this is you know sort of if you look at this this gray area, this is the the sort of uh, the general sort of error margin of most of the polls that were being conducted. Each little gray dot here is a polling result. Right, it's an individual result, and so you'll notice that uh, that things kind of are are peppered all all over the place up here. And then as the um, election gets closer, you'll notice that that the peppering is always within these gray bars for the most part. And of course, uh, there you know, uh, 538 wanted to highlight the uh, the final uh, Selzer poll. Uh, Ann Selzer is uh, uh, you know polls Iowa among other other things, but uh, Ann Selzer is generally a very very well regarded pollster. And you might recall uh, uh, that uh, the final Selzer poll uh, of the Iowa presidential election uh, in 2020 uh, was fairly different than the than uh, the consensus and was actually pretty close to the final result. Um, uh, so uh, you know, um, hats off to hats off to Ann Selzer for running running a good outfit uh, in Iowa. Uh, and so this dotted line here represents the actual result, right? And so you'll you'll see that some of these polls earlier uh, really were kind of close to that actual result. Uh, and then that as as you know you get sort of a cluster later, uh, it was probably pretty clear that there was some herding going on. You can't really prove it without being in the rooms of all these you know places where they discussed whether to release or not to release uh, a particular poll. But um, but it, it seems fairly clear that that's likely what happened. And that brings us to uh, uh, another practice that I did want to discuss with relating with relation to polls, and that is uh, the the idea of poll aggregation. What a poll aggregator does is they use the data from multiple polls in order to get a more accurate picture of what's going on. Uh, so a lot of uh, you know uh, journalists who who know a lot about this sort of thing try and tell you not to get too excited uh, about any one poll really uh, because. Um, especially in an environment where lots of polls are being conducted, being able to pay attention to data from multiple places uh, can really be a useful uh, a useful thing to do. Uh, it really can give you something of a better picture. But of course, poll aggregation itself is is pretty tricky. Um, it's much more complicated than simply taking an average of the poll results. Right? You can do it that way, um, but uh, but notice each of these polls has a different sample. They each have some have a likely voter model, some have a registered voter model, some have something in between. Um, some have uh, 
you know, some will will weight their samples in some ways, some will weight their samples somewhat differently. Uh, you know, some will use raking, some will not, some, you know, et cetera. So it's, it's some pollsters uh, really, you know, pay a lot of attention, you know, are, are pretty high quality, you know, pollsters. Uh, some polls that get published are not very high quality. Uh, they don't, they aren't, you know, very rigorous in the way that they collect their data. Uh, and, and so yeah, you, you sort of have to know these things in order to aggregate it well. And so uh, that's, you know, what's in the trick of the trade of poll aggregate. It really isn't just as simple as saying, "Oh, let's collect some polls and average them up." Um, there's there's a lot of judgment uh, and a lot of you know education that get that that gets rolled into that. Uh, some prominent poll aggregators uh, include uh, uh, Nate, Nate Silver's 538, uh, which is uh, currently affiliated with ABC News. In my view, I think they're sort of the gold standard of uh, poll aggregators. The, the quality of their analysis uh, tends, I think, to be uh, very good. Uh, their results uh, have, have spoken for themselves. They've had very good results uh, analyzing polls. Uh, the Upshot New York Times uh, uh, is, a, is a, another place you can go for some poll aggregation here and there. Uh, Real Clear Politics, I think, was one of the first uh, websites that I remember to do this. Um, uh, and then uh, pollster.com, or formerly pollster.com, is now Huff, the HuffPost pollster. Uh, so I've been doing this for, for quite a while. And there are plenty of others. Uh, and in fact, uh, as, as you start to get more and more poll aggregators, uh, it's, of course, inevitable uh, that uh, you should get an aggregator aggregator, right? And so uh, so Polyvote is a kind of project that sort of uh, tries to aggregate aggregators, uh, which is, uh, I don't know, perhaps one, one level of meta that's unnecessary. So uh, I want to say a couple of things uh, also about issue polls and some of the some of the differences, some of the different issues they face, um, in addition to the kinds of uh, issues that election polls face. One of the things that election polls don't really have to wor worry about so much, but the issue polls do, is question wording. All right, question wording is is a, is a very very important thing, uh, and it's, it's sort of so important that uh, you know that that's that's half the battle is trying to formulate good questions, uh, and and more often than not, what what will end up happening is that pollsters will end up formulating about nine different ways of asking the same question, uh, and then try and extrapolate if they get very different results on some of them, what caused those different results, uh, so that they can get a more accurate picture of what it is that people really think about certain issues. So as an example of question wording being important, I took this uh, survey from, you know, all the way back in 2014. Uh, how much is, you know, it seems like a, a lifetime ago in some ways. Uh, but the question is, in general, do you think local police forces should have military weapons and vehicles such as assault rifles and armored vehicles, or should these kinds of weapons be reserved only for the military and National Guard? All right. So, um, you know, that's the that's the the, the question that gets uh, published. And of course, you see some results there uh, from a couple of different uh, times when the poll was taken uh, again back in 2014. Uh, and this is one of those cases where, again, the wording might be very important. Um, it's hard to say for sure, uh, but it's possible that uh, the the wording might have tipped the results of this one. So specifically asking whether the police or the military should have military weapons, right? So you'll notice the uh, the phrase military weapons in here. Uh, that may uh, bias things uh, just a little bit. That might sort of suggest, well, of course, the police should have military weapons. I mean, if you ask, should the military have police weapons? Uh, you know, your, your initial sense is to just say, well, no, right? The police should have police weapons and the military should have military weapons. So, uh, you know, again, whether it, it may not have a lot to do with um, really answering the question one way or the other. Uh, and so uh, question wording is important in the sense that, um, uh, you know, one use of question wording affecting that can actually affect voting behavior is actually a, a thing. It's called push polling. Uh, and this is something that like reputable pollsters, like people who are actually public research firms, they don't do this, right? This is uh, sort of, you know, a no-no, but it is a thing uh, that sometimes gets done by uh, sort of political pollsters, what they call internal polls, that is pollsters that are working for a particular candidate or party. And the way this works is that they ask a large number of people a, you know, sort of hypothetical question uh, in, in, in a, you know, quote unquote poll. This is notice they're, they're oftentimes doing the survey not so that they can actually publish a result, but so that they can ask, you know, the, a, a large number of people a certain sort of quote unquote hypothetical question. And what that does is it sort of suggests something about a candidate to those who are being polled and actually can have an impact on voting. Uh, here's one example of push polling in action. Um, and uh, I've, I've put the, the, the source for this one. Uh, 
and the quote is, a famous example of push polling uh, involved the 2000 South Carolina Republican primary. I think that's a typo in the original. Uh, should be the Republican primary uh, in which voters received phone calls asking if they would be more or less likely to vote for candidate John McCain uh, if he hypothetically had fathered an illegitimate black child. Now, this was the year 2000. This is when John McCain uh, ran in the primary against uh, George W. Bush. George W. Bush eventually won that primary and um, uh, eventually became president. Um, uh, but it says here, the, the tactic was especially effective as McCain was campaigning at the time in the state with his adopted Bangladeshi daughter. Uh, the smear campaign was done anonymously. No candidate admitted responsibility. And despite initially leading in the polls, uh, McCain, in fact, lost to George W. Bush in that primary race, uh, 42 to 53. That's a, sort of one of the more um, uh, sort of heinous examples of push polling. But push polling is always fairly heinous. So uh, if, if we want to go back to more legitimate kinds of, of issue polling, uh, I'd mentioned earlier that it's important to ask the same question in lots of different ways. Um, and, and this is a, a very common practice among issue pollsters. Uh, so again, here's an example of, uh, of one of these kinds of, of, of questions, right? They say, thinking about the space program more generally, how much does the US space program contribute to CE below? Does it contribute a lot, some, not much, or nothing at all? And so in a sense, what they do is they, they, they ask, you know, uh, whether, you know, the space program contributes to scientific advances that all Americans can use or the country's national pride and patriotism uh, or encouraging people's interest in science and technology. And, and if you ask these individual things, people generally are very, very favorable toward the space program. When you when you point out individual things and ask them, hey, does the space program program do that? And they're like, and people say, yeah, I mean, the most common answer in most of these cases is a lot. Right. And the second most is some, right? You know, almost none of them are saying that, you know, there's nothing or not much. And then if you ask them the different question, in your view, is it essential or not essential that the United States continue to be a world leader in space exploration? Um, you know, uh, some of them, you, you get this sort of, um, you know, large, really large number that says uh, essential, and then this one says sort of not essential. And trying to square up these more specific questions with the more general question really gives you a more accurate idea of what it is that people are probably thinking. And so uh, if there are large discrepancies, then something's going on with the more general question. If there are not so large discrepancies, like in this case, uh, uh, people's views are, you know, tend to be fairly coherent. One of the biggest examples of um, of sort of you know uh, issue polling mysteries uh, that I remember from fairly recently is uh, back when um, when the Affordable Care Act was first proposed and and eventually passed uh, there was a lot of public polling about that issue uh, that was uh, very mysterious because what would happen is that when pollsters would ask uh, the public about um, you know individual provisions of the Affordable Care Act uh, also known as Obamacare if that's uh, when when pollsters would ask members of the public about individual, um, uh, you know, elements of that, such as, you know, uh, pre-existing conditions uh, or, or, you know, a, a health insurance marketplace or, you know, this, that or the other thing, right? Uh, people tended to be very much in favor of, 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 of each of those main specific planks. But then if you asked them if they were in favor of the Affordable Care Act or asked them if they were in favor of o Obamacare, uh, you got some very different results, right? For example, uh, if you just ask them if they were in favor of the Affordable Care Act, more people would respond favorably. If you asked people if they were uh, in favor of Obamacare, uh, fewer people responded favorably. Uh, you know, again, even in the very same sample of people. So it's it it was it was very hard to figure out what people really even thought. Um, it was, uh, I, I can't only imagine trying to be a policymaker and responding to these kinds of results where you say, well, okay, they like the individual pieces of this thing, but depending what you call the thing, they like it more or less. And I don't know what to, I don't know what to do with that. And uh, uh, again, I don't envy the uh, people who have to do something with all that. So uh, one of the last things I want to mention is um, that uh, in general, it's uh, important to avoid various kinds of cognitive bias when you're when you're putting together not only just a, not only a, a, a survey but a, but a, but a ballot itself. Um, and so, for example, the primacy effect is that when somebody's faced with a long list of things, they're more likely to only read or remember what is toward the beginning of the list, and they tend to overvalue items at the beginning of the list. Right? This is just a, a, again a well-known, well-studied feature of human nature. And so, if you're going to ever do a survey that involves a list, you have to, when you give that list, you have to mix up the order of the list, uh, uh, you know, and, and give that a, give that lots of different versions, randomized versions of that list. Otherwise 
is you're going to get some bias in favor of the things earlier on the list as opposed to later on the list. And the last couple things I, I wanted to mention uh, are related issues. Uh, and this is the issue of whether people do or do not sometimes lie to pollsters, right? Uh, this is controversial, right? We, we're, we're not really sure to what extent if this if this does really happen. There are some theories that it does. Uh, I want to discuss a couple of them. And uh, th these things will uh, will come back, right, in, in uh, the next discussion that we end up having about polls. Um, but I did want to uh, sort of mention them here. Uh, so in 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 person or live telephone polls, sometimes people might try and tell the pollster what they think the pollster wants to hear, because people generally are are fairly sociable, right? They they you know like people to like them, and you know that's that's a thing. That that, that social pressure may have some role in how people especially take uh, in person as opposed to you know sort of recorded or machine poll interviews or something like that. And in the UK, uh, they call this, uh, this has been called the, the shy Tory effect. And again, it's controversial as to whether there really is a shy Tory effect or really isn't. You'll, you'll get people argue either way, but it is at least something to think about. And the story goes, the theory goes, that uh, news media tends to be perceived as, as liberal, even, even though... Uh, it, it's not as clear, right, as you might think. Uh, uh, so in some UK elections, polls uh, might underestimate the number of conservative voters because some of those voters, you might say, told the media pollsters what they sort of thought those pollsters wanted to hear. Right. So that's that's the theory. Uh, um, that's you know I'll just leave it there. That's what's called the shy Tory effect. And uh, there's a related uh, issue that sometimes people may not admit to views that they think are not socially acceptable. Right. Even if they will privately vote that way. And one example of this is uh, what is called uh, the Bradley effect, uh, referencing uh, Los Angeles Mayor Tom Bradley, who, you know, some, some, we had some weird polling for, for, uh, uh, the, for Mayor Bradley's election. And so the idea is that, again, whether the Bradley effect is a real thing, whether it really happened um, uh, or, or, or whether it didn't, you'll find people who can offer some fairly decent arguments either way. Um, but the theory is that some voters told pollsters that they were voting for Bradley, uh, who uh, was an African-American candidate, or they said they were undecided when really they were not going to vote for him. And the theory is that these persons wanted to avoid the accusation, uh, implied or otherwise, because of course the pollster is not going to accuse them of anything, but they might, you know, sort of have in the back of their mind, they just want to avoid any implication that race had anything to do with their vote. Um, and whether race did or didn't have anything to do with those people's votes, their perceptions may have caused them uh, to lie to pollsters. Right? And again, whether whether some large number of people really did this, a large enough to actually affect the polling, who knows? Right? It's um, it's 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 there's there's not really any way to know for sure. Um, but uh, but these are a couple of issues that I wanted to. Uh, uh, you know, uh, bring up now uh, because we'll talk a little bit more about uh, something like these things uh, later. So that's some of the basic nuts and bolts of public polling. The next thing that I want to be uh, you know, sort of you know, taking a look at, so part two of this uh, uh, set of uh, lectures on polls, is going to have to concern uh, this this sort of widespread narrative that somehow um, polls were really really awful in 2016 and 2020 in in the presidential elections in the United States, um, and the reason to talk about this is because I think there's some really interesting things to be learned, uh, and uh, there's some you know about, about about polls themselves, about generalization in general, uh, and uh, also about the way that uh, people tend to interpret things like uncertainty. Uh, I think uh, there's a, a lot of really useful critical thinking stuff that is in some of those narratives. So we're going to take a look at some of those narratives and, uh, you know, sort of critically evaluate them um, in the next edition of uh, this lecture on polls and polling. <laughs>